Let me put you on game to a different way of thinking. Black King, empower the youth of the truth, got big dreams. Black King, all of my brothers that are for each other, that's how we know we. Black King, bringing more unity to community, yeah. Black King. Yes, you know what time it is. My royal family, my name is Walter Watts, and welcome back to King's Hour. Like always, I have my kings with me. Moog, talk to me. We are in here, baby. Let's get at it. That's right. JoJo, where you at? What's good? What's good? Uh -huh. Now, listen, for our listeners, this is part two. And if you have not listened to part one, I need you to pause, stop, halt, and go listen to part one because we do not want to lose you. You may have list, lost a couple of jewels there. So make sure you listen to that. And you can listen to King's Hour on any podcast platform. And you can also listen to us on YouTube. Just make sure that you search King's Hour so you don't get, forget to look at our pretty face as well. But for our listeners that listen to part one, welcome back. And you already know our special guest from Utah. Uh, we have Darren. How are you doing, Darren? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Hey, Pleasure we, to be back. That we're glad to have you back. And Dr. Baden, how are you doing? I'm good. What's good, everybody? Welcome back. Oh, yes. Another day in paradise. <laughs> right. And like I said, we change it up all the time. And here on part two of King's Hour, Black Men with Mental Health, we have a special, another special guest, another doctor, Dr. Ferguson. Please introduce yourself and where you are from. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Richard Ferguson. I hail from Washington, D.C., not too far from uh, RFK Stadium, where right. I was born and raised. And uh, I came out actually to Utah uh, when exiting the Army. I was an uh, active duty Army uh, battalion and brigade surgeon for about seven years. Uh, finished in family medicine uh, in the same uh, program as Dr. Baden. Uh, she was my senior. And uh, I left that and have been practicing locums emergency medicine for, oh, wow, I'd have to say about 10 years now. And I'm also the chief medical officer for a small Medicaid, Medicare health plan here. And I still, uh, and also the president and founder of Black Physician of Utah, trying to address uh, health disparities through educating the community and increasing representation of Black doctors in the state. Wow. That's beautiful. Let's make sure that we connect on that at the end of the episode so we can make sure our listeners are following you and make sure they get all the insight or events that you have coming up. So again, we are glad to have you guys here for part two of Black Men and their mental health. And on last our last episode, we talked about a lot that we had to make it a part two, but really the most important takeaway from everything was really creating a dialogue and making sure that we are comfortable as black men expressing our feelings to one another or family. Right, right. right. Hey, let me, can I interject real quick? Cause yeah. as I reflect a lot on the last episode and I've been really just trying to dive into how to figure out creating action around, you know, some of my thoughts and whatnot in there where I kept finding myself in a roadblock and I'm gonna try to articulate this the right way articulate this the right way but i have a problem of being vulnerable especially when i have a lot of examples throughout my life of when that vulnerability is held against me especially as a black man you know thinking about all the things that have been thrown at us i mean even the n-word itself you know we've been taught to do subdue so you know, I was trying to think, okay, let's get up, let's figure out, let's, let's, what does that look like? What does the peace look like? What does vulnerability look like? But I always run into, but you don't want to do that because remember the last time you were vulnerable and maybe it didn't happen at the moment, but somebody used that vulnerability against you later on mm. in life. Mm. So my question to the professionals here is how do you, what do you do? I mean, is there a set process that you've got with people to open them up? I mean, is it different with everybody? Just how do you create that dialogue and that vulnerability to get people talking? Do you want me to go first, Eric, or you want to go? Oh. So one thing about that Eric and I have to do often, uh, sometimes do the pressures of just the American healthcare system, is you have to try and engender trust and a rapport rather quickly. 
kind of helps with our status because people are coming to see you and they're at least saying, all right, well, this person's gone through training. So I hope they know what they're doing. So you got, we at least got that when they walk into the door. But so what I try to do is uh, if it's, if I suspect that, because most mental health concerns that present to me uh, is say if they're chronic in nature or maybe acute on chronic, they're presenting with often a somatic presentation. They're coming in with a chronic headache. They come, they're coming in with like this back pain. Mind you, you can have enough pain where you become depressed from it. Mm. Uh, and then we can go into pharmacotherapeutics to try to address both. But I try to first understand, all right, is this your only issue? Is there anything else? And I try to set the uh, visit, the expectations for the visit. Like this time is yours. Uh, I'm here to help you. Uh, and cause, cause some people want to, they're angry, they're in pain. Sometimes they want to fight. And, and when people don't want to be vulnerable, they try to put up a shield off. And, and then we have to, it's hard to break through a, the sort of the American man ethos of you can't cry and you can't show weakness. And I try to say, I'm here to help you. I, and I try to often convey, I know you don't want to be here, but let me help you to get well. So try to share as much as your history as possible. And I also um, try to connect with them either by some asking me about their day or something else about their family, or if they're there with a family member so that we can try to get this rapport built up. So they're more likely to share and become a little more vulnerable. But sometimes, you know, in the ED, I have a little bit more time. Uh, at some uh, direct primary care practices, they have a little bit more time. Right. Uh, but sometimes you have 15, 20 minutes. And if this is, you're really trying to reach to that person, I just try to say, I'm here for you. I may inject a little humor to, to get them to let their guard down a bit. Uh, and then I try to say, what else is really bothering you? What really brings you in today? Hmm. That's no, that's huge. Um, and Dr. Baton, I know you're going to say something as well. And another example I was saying, I was thinking of right now is if I am vulnerable with my partner, if I'm vulnerable with a friend, right, and I'm trying to be op open, emotionally open, and like Mook said, they use it against me in an argument or something like that later down the line, like how do you even mend that mentally for yourself? Is there something that you just have to be strong and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to continue to be open and have this dialogue. Is there something that you can even help listeners start that process? Um, I think in the beginning, as a provider, at least, I think it's important that the provider also has done some inner work in order to relate to other people. Because I think once you've done inner work, that energy just kind of exudes and people can feel that and, and gain a sense of um, maybe safety enough to share. Um, and I think in, in my practice, I've been fortunate to develop a relationship with people enough so that they can share. Now, personally, when you're talking about your friendships, I think it's important to realize that the people that you have in your life, you can cultivate those relationships. And so if the people in your life don't love you at your worst, mm. then there's something that there's something in that that you need to reevaluate. You Absolutely. know, what what we're trying to do when it comes to healing, when it comes to vulnerability, is to also love yourself at your worst, not just at your at your best. It's loving your whole self. And that's the kind of relationships you want to to foster. I mean, some of you are are married or about to be married, right? And think about your partner. There are things, yeah, I'm sure in an argument that you might throw some shade. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, when that when that bond, when that love is real, you know, they still have your back. And that's the kind of relationship you want to cultivate. And so maybe it's a, more about reevaluating. If this person cannot see me when I'm at my worst and still love me or still appreciate me or still value me, then why is this person really in my life? Because And then also realize that it's not about you. It's about the love that they have for themselves. And so they're projecting that negativity back onto you. And so that's the other part of it is to kind of take a step back and realize it's not you. Yes, they, they were mean. They were terrible. They were horrible. They, were, they threw that back in your face. That's a, a reflection of what they feel about, their, about themselves. Interesting. I, so as, as I think about what you're saying, especially the way that that you see love and, and and seeking that love i mean do you see particularly 
you know, when it comes to vulnerability, do you see a difference in demographics of the people that you see? I mean, obviously, male and female are, are, are going to be one thing in itself. But what about, you know, ethnicity? Do you see do you see the clear differences in that? Because, I, again, I only think from what it is to be a black man. And like if you're looking for the world to show me love, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get that a lot of places. So, you know, again, how I get let me stop. Do you see differences? Darren, do you want to you want to take this? What, yeah, I'm, okay. gentlemen. I'm trying to process the. I'm trying to see what, the, what I'm trying to get to the heart of the original question was, um, with, that you're asking to begin with. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little lost in that and, and trying to find out. Um, you know, we have a medicalized version of vulnerability, or at least to try to explain that. Uh, can, you know, sort of juxtaposed to an inner inner experience. And then nestled somewhere in there needs to be the root of the problem, which, of course, is when you're talking about white supremacy. We talked about that last time. So uh, at least for black men, at least, and for black women as well, or any, any black person that walks this earth, white supremacy is at the heart of it. And part of that is to convince black men that they're less than, right? right and that, right. of course, informs the whole spectrum of, of uh, how we identify ourselves, and, and, you know, uh, you know, Doc mentioned it earlier when he talked about. By the way, Doc, my, uh, thank you for your service, my brother. I am I'm Army as well. Thank you for your service. So, uh, right, well, I was, uh, well, I was uh, glad to hear what I heard. What I what you had to say. Praise God, we had. A, I don't even know how important this is. This brother right here, and and uh, we have so few black officers uh, in in the military who are line officers. You know um, that have his experience, Doc's experience. Uh, it's it's rare, so I'm gonna tell you that right now. So the army was kicking brothers out not too long ago, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, in droves. Mm -hmm. Wow! Uh, so congratulations, my brother, for all you've done Absolutely. and all you continue to do. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you too for yourself. So welcome. Um, so that's the way I'm looking at it. So you yeah. guys know I'm always at the root of the heart of the matter, and so we have to. And 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 um, Dr. Baden's beautiful, you know, uh, um, rather than outward facing. The, these issues, turning them inward, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, inner, the inner experience and what that's about and how that shapes us and how it uh, creates this cycle, this vicious cycle that we've all inherited from, mm -hmm. unfortunately, where we live and the circumstances of our birth and so on. So it's more than just, um, I think, uh, taking medication or, yeah. uh, or being evaluated. I think it's something much deeper than that uh, before you even get to that point. Uh, if people are otherwise normal and have neurotypical, you know, behaviors and so on and so forth. Most definitely. Now, that makes complete sense because obviously the question was, is important because we have different people that come from different backgrounds. It could be internal where they need to make sure that they look inside and be like, hey, it's not just me and it's maybe the people around me. It's also just making sure that you you can be vulnerable with your provider or someone to get your feelings out there. So, once um, a patient or someone has gotten to the point where they are comfortable and open enough to sit down and talk to you. And again, the most important thing that you guys both said is that you try to make a connection. You know what I mean? When you talk about mental health, it's not just about drugs and things like that. It's about creating a bond. And that's what a lot of people don't think about. I'm going to a doctor, I'm getting some medication. Hopefully I feel good. Most of the time, you need to sit down and talk to somebody so they understand you, and then we know where we're going from there. Because sometimes you may not even need medication, but we need to find out what the heck is going on. And I, and I love that you guys said that. And that kind of goes into my next question is like, once you've created a bond and you figure out that there may be an underlying issue, what is the next step from there? Are there symptoms that someone could be looking out for for themselves? Let's talk about depression. That's something that is prevalent in um, black men, what is something that they can be looking out for to see like, hey, maybe I do need to come and ask for help because I think I am depressed? Uh, anybody, well, I'll take that if nobody, y'all can certainly chime in. So um, in my practice, uh, I'm seeing more men than I have uh, before. So I'm actually a PA, if you didn't know that from the last episode. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I work in I work in psychi- psychiatry, so um, I see a lot more men than I have been before, which is a good thing because men generally don't don't come to to seek care um, and are very very uh, underrepresented in, psych- in psychiatry. Um, although the pandemic has certainly changed a lot of that, we're seeing more. I'm sure primary care can probably uh, add to this as well. But uh, so men, we, we've been conditioned not to see, to, to to not to even look at our. It, it's taboo to even go mm-hmm. there, and you'll see that within certain cultures, right? In certain cultures, it might be uh, 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 a boy just pray it away. You know, pray, go ahead and pr- just pray. Pray it away to get to get what you got to get at, and then other cultures will be like, uh, 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 it's, "It's the devil, you know. You ain't going to church enough, you know." And it's mysticism associated with 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 the male, you know, the male, you know, whatever whatever we want to call the male identity, what you know, which is contrived to begin with, in my opinion. Um, and so, um, y'all, I think uh, you know, you know, we talked about this last week. Um, we mentioned this in terms of the, the, the notion of trust and that men um, tend to get more. If, if men want to be healthy, right, they have, they have a better chance of being healthy if they go see a woman, a woman pr- in, in primary care. Because mm-hmm. women in primary care tend to follow the guidelines, right? They're stricklers to the guidelines, whereas men are like more cavalier about it. You know, I mean, let's try some different things, add some, some salt and pepper in here, shake it up a little bit. And, uh, you know, and, and, that, and that might not necessarily be, uh, you know, the, be, the best care for, for the patient. But uh, in, my, in, my, in my field, I, I see it, I see, don't see a, as many men as I see women, but I'm seeing more men. And when I see them, I praise God because generally I don't see men. And uh, they come in that's, to the clinic. That's huge in itself is that men are actually open enough to come in there to mm-hmm. talk and ask for help. Um, so again, I, I even asked you, Dr. Uh, Baden, if if I'm coming to you now, I feel like there may be something. What could you tell our listeners of maybe some warning signs that they could be looking out for? So in my practice, um, whoever walks to my door, I'm screening everybody, regardless of what you're coming in for. <laughs> so um, that's just how I, that's how I roll because I just feel you can't have complete health without assessing mental health. So when you walk in my door for the first time or if it's the first time of the year, you're getting an assessment. There's two different assessments. One is called a PHQ-9 that looks for symptoms of depression. And then another one is called a GAD-7, which looks for symptoms of anxiety. And that's just at a baseline. I even do it in kids from um, 11 on up. So that's that's just my MO right there. But um, And real quick, not to cut you off, but uh-huh. express the importance of the PHQ-9. Um, I don't think we're getting that enough out there is because we come in there and we assess patients or I don't, but I'm a, mm-hmm. you, the patients are getting assessed and maybe they're not getting this, this paper to help identify maybe something that's actually um, mm-hmm. wrong. So again, just what is the, what are some of those criteria for listeners? They're like, Hey, I, I know you screen them, but what does that mean? Yeah. So it's a questionnaire. It's a self-assessment. And I think it's, it's beautiful because it provides both subjective and objective um, measures to, to suggest that maybe somebody may have mild, moderate, or severe depression. Um, and just because you answer a certain way doesn't mean you're automatically going to get um, a medication that day, but it's just a good baseline um, of where you are for that day. And, and it can be very situational. I mean, you could have had somebody um, pass away recently. You could have had a breakup. Um, and so your scores may be different at different times of the year, and that is okay. But just the fact that it gets a person thinking about, oh, yeah, I have been feeling tired lately. I have been eating more, sleeping more. I have been angry or irritable. You know, those are some of the questions. And, and then you're putting words into the feelings and emotions that they probably couldn't process to you otherwise. And so that, mm. that's another way that helps me know that mm, there's a little bit more going on. Uh, I love it. And... I'm coming to you, Dr. Ferguson, because we talked about this a little bit um, off air and the importance that depression doesn't mean that everyone has the same cookie cutter depression. Um, Like Dr. Baton said, there's mild, there's moderate, there's severe. So express a little bit from your background on maybe patients don't always need medication, like Dr. Baton said, based off of their type of depression. Yeah, so 
uh, as we were talking about earlier, uh, I had to take care of uh, quite a few young enlisted soldiers that were in early signs of stress disorders and often anxiety provoked uh, due to this constant uh, either visualiz visualizing trauma uh, often in the Middle East or sometimes on their own base. Uh, and it's just, it, and then they start to kind of have this uh, almost like a battle fatigue or, or stress. Uh, this is all like precursor to being formally diagnosed with PTSD. But I noticed that many of the, I don't want to call, call them quite lazy. I'm sure in some regard, they might've been following their guide, a guideline that might've been much older, but they were very quick to put a lot of my soldiers or they eventually were, were soldiers under my care, but they would come in and they would say that I don't even know if they might've done the PHQ, PHQ two or the nine for them. But all I know is many of these guys were placed on SSRIs, SNRIs, and uh, they were never uh, placed or had it commingled with counseling opportunities. They said mm -hmm. they felt that putting them on the pill and then put them back, putting them back in the service. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that's not how, uh, as we as clinicians, particularly physicians, are trained. Now, some of us don't always follow due to sometimes the rigors and constraints and time to provide with the patient. But you got to make time uh, because then you're not providing optimal care. So as I was dividing it up and discussing earlier, many mild to moderate, you do a trial of therapy first. And we do that based on that scaling score sometimes to give us a little bit of a hint mm -hmm. of how much uh, they uh, where we would start. So mm -hmm. that PHQ-9, I think it's like zero to 27. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Erica. Um, and the thing is, many of the depression that I see or that I've seen that's been presented, especially back in my military time, they were mild to moderate. And so many of these guys, I would have said, hey, let's get you into counseling. Let's get you a peer support group. Let me get you a battle buddy that you can rely on. Let's do that for the next 45 to 60 days. Now, if he was more of a threat or a risk to himself, then I'm like, all right, this is more crisis. Let's get you out of the crisis period first. And then we can take time to, pee, to treat your depression or your anxiety. And so I would always push and offer counseling because there's so it's so readily available and yeah. paid for by the army. And, and it's readily available at almost many, I would say uh, more, if you have more than a thousand or 2000 employees, you have EAP, employee assistance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they will give you, as long as you're a full-time employed or a point better than a 0.75 FTE, you can go see a counselor. But someone's got to tell you about that benefit. Someone's got to suggest it. So if you're going to your primary care and they never mention it, and they're just going to put you on this pill that's going to give you all these side effects, and they may not even discuss it with you. And that's often what I had to deal with. I had young soldiers, often brothers, placed on SSRIs. They're getting nauseous. They're getting anxious. They didn't know that they had to taper up. You know, they didn't understand uh, some of the directions well. And that's how they, some people get lost to follow up. Then they feel worse because they just come off. They don't get refilled. They never got counseling as well. So you just did almost, in a way, harm. Yeah. What makes you think they're going to trust you to go seek and trust this healthcare system again? Crazy. So that's, that's why I often say. That's huge. And if, so if you're moderate to severe, and that's when I'm like, I go, when's the last time you did something that was fun? Yeah. Uh, when, you know, how many times a week do you play with your kids? Do you enjoy your job? Uh, mm -hmm. And if they start answering no to a lot of that, or no or not at all, then I'm like, you know, Let's try 30 days, come back and see me. Here's an appointment. We can consider this pill, but I'm going to start real low and I'm going to go slow yeah. because ramping up. Uh, Always has side effects. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, I hope I answered the question there. But my, my point was I pushed uh, counseling a therapist first. And, and then if they're mo if there's moderate to severe, I'm like, you got to have it at the same time. Because we know severe depression, people do better with the pills but they still need therapy, like all Absolutely. three tiers do. Yeah. And so, well, well mine, I got a quick question. It, it'll be a, maybe a two minute answer, but I feel like once you move over to therapy, there's therapies that work and therapies that don't. I mean, one-on-one -on -one sessions don't always work with everybody. You know, I always also mentioned you no know, peer group. So how do you go through that trial? Because getting them to that point, you know, is one thing, but then, what do you walk through? How do you get to figure out what works for who when it comes to therapy? One, I ask them, have you done it before? You know, some okay. of these people that I've seen, they're like, hey, I didn't like my last therapist. And that's when I immediately will suggest, and these are often veterans, active duty. But 
there's there's these group support sessions that almost every Wasatch Behavioral Health, Davis Behavioral Health, many of them have these group sessions where they meet once a week and you're with other people with similar disorders and there's and you have a moderator, a therapist that's there with you. Okay. So uh, you're not alone because it's a struggle when you feel like you have no one or you're the only one experiencing this and, and you're not. And it's a little bit different for everyone. But it's if you have a safe space, uh, then I feel that it's, it's therapeutic as well. And, it, and then you got time to to allow the meds to work because it's not fast. That's what right. a lot of people need to understand. It takes weeks. And then you got to see if you get on the right dose. Yeah. Right. So, and so it's important that you say that, uh, Jojo, do you have some? No, I just wanted to know, um, in you guys' practice, do you guys see black males being pushed to meds faster, to therapy faster, to even kind of thrown to the side? I know obviously you guys aren't doing it in your own, but like in the, in the medical field, what do you guys see? I think, um, you know, you you always hope that the clinician or the provider that is seeing a person is treating them as an individual and seeing where that person is at that time and, and doing what's best for that one person and not generalizing a population. But we all know that that's not necessarily true. Um, it's also important to realize that um, in 2013, there was a fifth re revision of the DSM, that diagnostic manual that gives us criteria how to diagnose people, but it wasn't um, representative of primary care physicians' um, input. And primary care physicians actually provide 87% of mental health care um, out there. So when you look at the revision from the DSM-5 in 2013, it actually was not very scientific and it, it, it provided criteria where it wasn't very um, robust in saying that this equals this. And so we found that there was an overutilization of diagnoses and people being put on medications for many just life stressors. So, and then people being overdiagnosed with attention deficit or people, especially like adolescent young black men being diagnosed with behavioral concerns when right. it wasn't really a behavioral concern and then putting on other medications. So it's, um, I don't even know if I'm answering your question well, but it's, no, it's, yeah. it's um, it's a very fun, it's a very tricky process. So right. it's a lot of data that's not there, right? Yes. And you're not, yeah, it's a lot. That's crazy. Lot yeah, that's 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 a trip because um, like I said before, I'm a pharmaceutical rep and I deal with bipolar disorder, and I have to talk to um, clinicians mainly about how to diagnose a bipolar patient when you would think that's a psychiatry job. But like you said, you, the, your MDs, they're getting all of it. The uh, family practice, they're getting it all. So I think it's really important to have these conversations and understand that it can't just be about the medication part. It has to be just educating yourself and looking at these symptoms because counseling, and I'll use myself as an example, I didn't ever try counseling until I found out that my job provided it. And again, then... I didn't know that until my mother passed away. And then there, my manager was like, oh, you know, we have counseling. It was like, why does it have to be something so severe where you see I'm affected now that I need counseling? Rather than just that being the norm of, hey, here's your, benef your benefits for your, your job. You know what I mean? And I had no idea I had that. Free, didn't have to pay anything. I had um counseling for myself i had marriage counseling i had children i had a, i had everything and had no idea so Most people I, don't know what it means so like if they say know. oh there's your list of benefits eap what is that employee assistant program I'm like oh so that means i get free tickets or i get like a crutch it's not explained well so that's why many people wouldn't even think about it but it's something that's underutilized that's paid that the your job will pay for highly underutilized. And then also letting people know that that EAP uh, program is usually off campus. So um, don't fear that somebody from your office is going to see you going. It's oh, pretty confidential. Point. Yeah. All right. Because and that's what we talk about, like um, the distrust is you don't want people to know that you're going to counseling and you don't know if someone's going to talk bad to you, your manager or whatever the case may be, if you perceive that that being weak. So again, I think having this open dialogue to know that 
that should be the norm before you get on pills and go these other other different routes. So um, even moving on, just talking about the distrust part, what do you think that comes from? I know we talked about it a little bit last time, but um, how do we get past that as black men to hopefully have trust in the system? Like, hey, if we come educated and we come open and honest, is there a way that we can be a little bit more open to having that trust with our providers? It's so hard because there's just so little representation, you know? Um, and I think that's that's half the battle is just finding, I mean, even going to therapy and thinking about the therapist sitting across from you, you know, looking at that person, you're like, how are you going to understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. Why am I going to spend all this time explaining to you where I'm coming from and how I got here? When if I went to somebody else, they would already know. Mm. So, um this no, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please. I was going to say, do you think it's important to get people that look like us? Is that what we need to reach out for to get us more comfortable? It's a good start because you're <laughs> more likely to have someone that's going to have less bias and they're going to be culturally competent. So that's that's one way. That's one way. So if you can't, maybe look for reviews of someone where they. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm telling y'all, those reviews are heavy. I. When I when I tell you I was looking for months before I before I you know I called uh you know the, my doctor, but I'm looking at reviews. I'm looking at every website. I'm jumping on everything. I'm like I'm not playing around with it, but I gotta find somebody that looks like me because I've had other doctors in the past and I spoke to Walt about it. Moop, where I've been diagnosed with things. I'm like I don't, you know I don't know if that's true. I go I finally find a doctor that looks like me. Um. To go even deeper, it was a kidney. My my kidneys function at a high level. I go to another doctor and they're like, well, most black men's kidneys do function at a high level. That's that's normal. And I'm just like, wait, so I'm getting muscle biopsies and I'm getting all these different things. And they come to find out my kidney function is normal for you know, for, for, for me. So I think it's for me it was super important to find somebody that looked like me and kinda of understood, like you said, the cultural differences um when it comes to, you know, going to see a doctor. What what would be your recommendation on how frequently you visit, you know, somebody to talk to our psychiatrist? Psychiatrist, is it something that you just set up when you are in a situation where you need to talk to somebody, or is it healthy to have somebody that you're just regularly talking to without there being a problem or present? I think there's always a benefit. Oh, sorry, go on. Just to make sure that there's um, an explanation. So psychiatrists don't always provide counseling, but they do prescribe medications. And then psychologists or a social worker or a therapist usually provide the counseling. So it just depends on what route you're looking for. Um, and so I would say it's probably more important to have a therapist, social worker, counselor, and a primary care, but that's my bias. <laughs> okay. And, and, and sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 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 It sounds like you're gonna explain the benefits of that. And, uh, and for frequency, I tell everybody, if you can get in, I, I said, even if you think you have a healthy relationship with your family, your significant other, I've only seen benefits from counseling. Uh, and so I tell everybody, don't you know that if you can go to a third party and discuss some things that you've been thinking about or troubling and you go in, even if you just debrief with them and you get, and maybe they're just actively listening and like you've been heard and you, you left not feeling judged. And if they did, pick up something, they can give you suggestions. It, it's almost like kind of like in a way, almost having a coach, but you know, for your mental health, Absolutely. why would you not want to check in for that with that person? So I, I made a point being a disabled veteran that I have a therapist and yeah, did it start when I, you know, got really, really sad uh, and depressed after a breakup. And I, I went to someone over here at the VA Salt Lake and, they took care of me. And, and so it sometimes it starts with a triggering event. But if I can convey to anybody, don't wait for that. Take care of yourself mm -hmm. now. Treat your mental health just like you would treat your body. Don't wait until because it's an organ, too. Right. And so you don't want to wait till it's impaired until you treat it. So and Eric and I have to battle this all the time. You know, a lot of people care a lot about their eyes. So they're going to do exactly what they say by, for their eye doctor. But they don't often sometimes listen to their family medicine physician when they say, hey, if you don't control your blood pressure, 
in eight years or 10 years, you're probably going to have a stroke and then you're not going to be able to work anymore. And people are like, ah, that's the silent killer. Can't, can't, doesn't seem tangible, but we're still trying to protect an organ. Yeah. And we're trying to address any dysfunction that might be current. Same with your brain, same with your mental health. So I tell everybody, don't wait, just get in, see if you have access, make sure you're insured. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's sometimes there, I think there's some free therapy that's offered by some counties. Uh, but it's based on need. Uh, but yeah, I encourage everybody. I mean, my uh, significant other and I, my fiance, and we got engaged about uh, five weeks ago now. Congrats hey, hey, congratulations. Uh, Don't try to just go over that real quick. That was quick. He was going to let us fly over. <laughs> <laughs> and first thing I said is like, all right, well, we're going to get some premarital counseling. Well, why do we need that? We do. We do. You're marrying I- me, so. We do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's now that's on a whole that's nother cool. level is doing the premarital uh, counseling because again, most people only do that when there's an issue. You know what yep. I mean? And the biggest thing is like you did that because you've had counseling and you understand the benefit. I found so many people that have tried counseling because maybe something happened or something they were sad. And then once they've got through that, they stayed with counseling. That's not just that's people do that. You know what I mean? That's not just like one person or two people. Like once you realize how beneficial that could be, like you want that around. I uh, I had my I told my grandma one time. This is uh, personal, but you know I told my grandma I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go to do some counseling and talk. And my grandma was like, no, don't do that. Come talk to me. We'll sit down and have a conversation and I can help you. And I felt like in that moment, I was like, see, this is why people don't go get counseling or ask for help because they'll go talk to grandma. You know what I mean? And we have to be the the change a little bit and be like, okay, it's cool to go to counseling Mm -hmm. because they're going to know a lot more than me or my my grandma. You know what I mean? So uh, I I think it's it's important. Premarital premarital counseling is clutch. That's that's dope. That's yeah. super dope. And to speak about someone deterring, so my family was my my dad. Uh, he passed away about seven years ago now, and he said he when I considered counseling in the past, he says, "Don't do that. Your job will find out." Mm-hmm. So that's how my dad was. He was worried about me being able to maintain employment. You'll find out in your record, which is also another reason why sometimes active duty soldiers will not volunteer because mm-hmm. they're worried about being ejected from their army. Mm-hmm. Interesting. They may not have the skills to set up to immediately go into a job. And when we know the unemployment rates higher for veterans, so they will not want something in their record until maybe at the very end, which means they didn't get treated while in, but the system, but you know, cause commanders have some, some leeway and sometimes things aren't as protected as they should be. When someone that's non-medical can maybe know about your medical history and you mm-hmm. just hope they're fair and they don't use that against you. I've seen that happen. They'll be like, oh, that's the crazy soldier over there. He's I on all the fitness. I see it the same. I have some officers in my practice and, you know, it's a fine line between what they want to share or what they want in their record for the similar yeah. reason. Yeah. yeah. Reasons. How, do they have no, how is there no protection from that? Say again. I said, how, how is there no protection from that? It's about the enforcement of it. So it's like many things in the military. Uh, they write they write many a law, but, a, but if it's an old boys club and no one wants to enforce it and it's fight first, think about a soldier's health later, that, that sometimes occurs. And mm. so um, they're not always putting the soldier first. I'll put it that way. Right. Mm. Mm. So you're probably making a lot of enemies. I mean, I, I mean, especially thinking about you being in the army, you're in the belly of the beast, right? <laughs> where you are in a profession where you are not supposed to talk about mentality and your mental well-being at all. And you're on the other side of this where you're trying to attack that and open that up for these mm-hmm. individuals. So I can only imagine the position that you are. Well, maybe not. Maybe they're open to having them talk to you. But do you find yourself being in conflicting situations? I guess when you were back in the army, I was a, I would say I was a mid grade officer. So rank helps mm-hmm. if you're the only doc amongst a bunch of non docs, then that kind of degree in the training. I'm like, no, I know better. This is my place. You're going to do as I recommend. 
So that's mm. sometimes the only thing that kind of saved me. Uh, and I had to tell somebody that outrank me, but you know, it's a Colonel and I'm like, yeah, you're wrong here, sir. Uh, respectfully. Uh, and not <laughs> All right. Cause I think in the net, cause they understood that I may not play their game and I'm like, I will document that you went against my wishes and that's not going to be good for you if, if mm. something bad happens to him. Yeah. Okay. Like, that's often how I said, I was like, I'm okay. trying to help you. Right. 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 <laughs> help me sustain so, the soldiers. So we've, we've come to a place where now we're open, we're honest, we're asked for help. We've maybe had counseling and now you have a patient that maybe does need medication. Um, what information should patients know before they go see a clinician about an SSRI. And please, uh, Dr. Baden, help me under, help me explain what an SSRI is. And, um, and yeah, just kind of the normal steps on maybe giving someone an antidepressant. So again, looking at their presentation, looking at their scores from those questionnaires we talked about earlier, how much time has lapsed? Are they still having symptoms that are interfering with their day to day? Um, and also knowing what the symptoms are troubling them the most, because depending on where they are, there's certain medications that might fit their profile a little bit better. There's some that have some overlap with both depression and anxiety. Um, there's some that are better like boosters if people need a little bit of oomph. There's some that are better at helping people um, mellow. There's some that have fewer sexual side effects than others. And so just kind of getting to know where they are and what their needs are in that moment. And then um, letting them know and being honest and transparent that it's very much a trial and error process. Trial on their part um, and an error on our part to figure out what may or may not work best. Got you. And, I, and, I, and, to, and to follow on with that, it's, I do go through their options, especially when we do get to meds. Like for, and I'll give a personal story. When I was diagnosed with adjustment disorder with depressive effect, I was offered bupropion. And so that's one of the medications that will tend to have less of a uh, sexual side effect and actually sometimes can help libido. Many people state and it's very, and it's more mild uh, and it's you dopamine. can start low with it. Uh, but but I, I found it hard to take pills. Even though I tell people to do it all the time, I had to take it twice a day and it was hard to take twice a day. And this is a doctor telling you that it was hard and I'm not impaired. And I know as someone was telling me to take it, but you know what I decided? Is I said, you know what? I'm going to keep, I'm just going to go see my counselor more. Luckily I had the ability and the time and the resource to do that. And then I got through my hump and I said, you know what? I don't need these pills. But in the beginning, I did try to start taking them regularly. And, uh, but so what I do is I go through like, Hey, these are your four options. And first I have to figure out, am I treating depression? Am I treating anxiety? Or is this a little bit of both? Yeah. And how is it a function? Oftentimes yeah. it's transdiagnostic. I think it's, um, again, <laughs> the DSM just bothers me so much, but it's not fair to take a human being, a complex, beautiful human being and lump them into one category. Oftentimes it's transdiagnostic. We don't fit neatly into one box or another. And so to say that I'm just gonna address this part of you without addressing that part of you, I think it's it's kind of myopic in how how the practice can be. Yeah. And that's a lot of times how you layer medications as well, rather than trying to treat the core symptom, you'll try to treat every issue. And then that's how a lot of times patients will have four or five medications, like an antidepressant, an anxiety medication, a sleep uh, pill, mm -hmm. um, when maybe it's counseling and just treating kind of the depression part could benefit all those other symptoms that they're, they're getting. So I think that's a, that's a huge point. And, Compliancy, right, Dr. Ferguson? Like, I you could take one pill twice a day, <laughs> right? <laughs> I can imagine two twice a day, but you might we might forget it. You know, what right. I mean? you right there. So, and Erica can attest to this. Once you start pushing people past two pills, you're lucky to get what is it like thirty percent sometimes compliance once you go past two. So, imagine if someone right. told to take four pills a day, they're probably taking half to a third of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Even though they'll say, yeah, I'm taking my meds, doc. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you? Right. So 
So what do you say to the person that's scared of getting hooked? You know, they're open to trying it, but they're scared of being reliant. I guess I'd have to understand what hooked means. You mean so like dependent? Luke, Luke, you bring up a good well, point. I, because most well, of these medications, the they're supposed to only be for three to six months. We're only supposed to be prescribing these medications for three to six yeah, months. Not less. And so I think what you're saying, Luke, is, you know, people who maybe want to take it for the rest of their lives because they mm -hmm. like that feeling that they're getting that suppression, that numbing, right? Um, is that what you mean? Yeah, maybe they feel like this is this is what gets me out of this slump. Right. I need this forever. This is but, my new normal yeah. and I don't want to mess with it. Yeah. Right. Uh, we do see that a lot. And and it's I think it's again, like uh, Dr. Ferguson mentioned, being as transparent as possible, you know, letting letting them know these are supposed to be a temporary course of action. Um, a three to six month period will reevaluate. Um, we'll try to get you um, tapered down as much as possible to the lowest effective dose. Um, is therapy working for you? Maybe we try a different uh, therapist for you or we go a different route because if this is something that you need for the rest of your life, then we are not really addressing the core issues, the core concerns. We're just palliating them or, or numbing them. Hmm. Yeah, three to six. I didn't know it was just three to six months. I know, oh, yeah. I know many people that take, take it, been taking it for years, you know. <laughs> And that's I, what I didn't know that. they, they should be trying to transition them off. Many, right. so if anyone get the in your listeners, go in. And this is where it helps to have an advocate. This is where I go back again. It's okay to question. And I think there's a fear of like, I don't want to get back to where I was five years ago when I was mm -hmm. really in a dark place. That's my fear. That's why I don't want to get off it. Or I tried to get off it before and I felt awful because the tapering, you get these. Uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, you feel like electric shots are going across your skin, you get headaches, you get sweats. This is just with the taper. So then that person just needs to be on a slower taper. But it's like, mm -hmm. is you, if your mind's right, though, and you were on something for 10 years, that's going to be a slow taper. I mean, we're looking at four, maybe five month taper. Instead mm -hmm. of someone, if they're on it three to six months, you can get them off it in about 30 days. And so that's the concern. And that's the fear. People don't want to feel sick and you will feel sick. You'll feel like you have, you know, uh, COVID, the OG strain. That would be the Wuhan one I'm referring to. Right, it's right, Wuhan. right. I think it's 0157. Anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but, but that's my point. So there's an aversion. And so I don't know if I necessarily see it as dependency as opposed to a fear of what's going to happen. What's the alternative is I'll feel like crap and then I got to go back on it again. Right. And, so, right. and then there's some folks where their symptoms are so chronic, they need it to function and they can't get off. But that's, that's actually the minority. Uh, and so uh, SSRI, so selective serotonin reuptake, uh, uh, reuptake inhibitors, and then SNRIs, SNRIs, are not as effective in treating depression and anxiety. They're kind of a little bit better for depression in if you have a comorbidity of pain. That's how they're a little bit better. But when it just comes to treating a straight disorder, SSRIs are more well studied, less side effects. But they're highly prescribed here in Utah. Some of it's part of the cultural effects and pressure, particularly in women here. And so mm. it's prescribed a lot and it's often a go-to and it's, it's, a, it's part of the culture here. You know, I think they, I remember when I arrived here in 2010, there were many a jokes about how it's in the Provo River, you know. So long, lower tier. Oh, man. That are prescribed that in Utah County. Yeah. Uh, and, and in Salt Lake County as well. And you would think, wow, these people seem pretty happy, but everybody's on it. Yeah. You know? And I don't know if they are often being given or mentioning, like, you can stop counseling uh regularly or every two months could be a great and cheaper alternative uh because you never want to go on some trip and then you run out or you didn't get your refill yeah and then you're miserable as you're having acute withdrawal off this medication so it's either fear of withdrawal or fear that i don't go back to my dark place where mm -hmm. i didn't have my emotions or control before Got you. No, that, that makes complete sense. Um, and I've seen people where they, because they're feeling better, they'll stop an SSRI cold, tar cold turkey. Ooh. And sometimes they have bad effects there. So 
the listeners, make sure that you're paying attention to the titration is huge on making sure that you're staying compliant and staying stable. Yeah. Now, in the mental health as well, when because I'm telling doctors to use my medication all the time, I also have providers that have patients that don't want to use pills at all. You know what I mean? So what are some of the other options, maybe a natural um, resource or spiritual resource that people can do to help with their anxiety and depression if they don't want to take medication from the from a doctor? Um, there's lots of different options and things that are um, on the in the woodworks. Um, let me just give you a statistic too. There's been over estimation on efficacy on some of these medications um, mm. that are traditionally prescribed by pharmaceutical companies. So there's been some head-to-head data between like placebo versus their medications, especially in mild to moderate symptoms where there's not that much of a difference, but the pharmaceutical company may not divulge that information or publish that information. So um, I think it's up to us as clinicians to do a better job at giving people time and other, other resources. So when we talk about other ways to treat um, depression, anxiety, and other mental health concerns, there are what we call plant medicines that are available. Um, There are things that are um, currently in phase two and three trials with the FDA, um, things that are going to be possibly rescheduled or reclassified uh, to Mm. provide some, um, some benefits. Some of these medications that are coming up, again, that are gonna be reclassified have shown remission rates after maybe one or two doses that have lasted six to 12 months. And so that's going to be huge and um, an incredible game changer for the pharmaceutical industry who has people on these medications day after day. day. Again, what does remission mean? Thank you. Yes. So remission uh, means symptom free time, or maybe even you don't meet criteria for that diagnosis anymore. Yeah. And that's huge to have something that's effective that fast because like you guys have said, um, normally it takes weeks on end mm-hmm. to have some type of remission-based efficacy. So that's that's huge to even hear that there's different medications that are coming out. But even these medications too, it's, it's not the medication itself, it's in conjunction with psychotherapy. So it's mm. this medicine-assisted psychotherapy, that medicine-assisted psychotherapy. And so it's hard to know if it's just the medicine itself or the psychotherapy itself or the combination thereof, but it seems to be that combination thereof that's producing these benefits. And plus it's giving people like 40 hours of intensive therapy and specific therapy, therapy that they may have not had access to. So it's mm. pretty, it's pretty um, remarkable. If we could have everyone undergo this kind of therapy with medicine, um, what kind of outcomes we could have. What is um, psychotherapy? Going to a therapist or a counselor, there's different types of um, psychotherapy. There's cognitive behavioral therapy. There's internal family symptoms, systems. There's ACT. There's all different levels of therapy that may have a uh, may have a better treatment approach to certain um, ailments than others. So, like if somebody's significantly anxious, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, may be a better um, form of treatment. There's things called EMDR, which I'm sure some of you have heard of when it comes to like PTSD treatment Mm. and helping um, replace memories in different parts of the brain so that they're better um, processed. Um, Mm. So there's lots of amazing things in the woodworks. And then these newer medicines, again, that are going to be reclassified hopefully soon have also shown tremendous efficacy when it comes to addiction. So alcohol use disorders and opiate abuse and withdrawal. So it's, hmm. it's pretty exciting. And they said we're in an opi- opioid epidemic, right? We are. And, you know, some of these medicines that are going to be reclassified hopefully soon have been in use for thousands of years um, by in- indigenous people, um, mm. by our people. There's uh, something called Evogaine that is used in Western and South Africa. And that has been right now in like phase two trials showing such tremendous efficacy with opiate um, abuse and withdrawal. Ebo gain, what is that? If you give us a little background. It's hard, it's, it's, a, it's a plant medicine, but we don't quite yet know what it is and how it works. Um, mm-hmm. We know of like other things like um, ayahuasca that mm-hmm. works with um, 
certain neurotransmitters, specifically like, um, you know, your serotonin, it works with uh, a little bit of dopamine. It works with a couple of different things that we traditionally know mm -hmm. um, with, with our SSRI medications. But these have been around for, for thousands of years and we have receptors in our brain specific to these plants. Animals have receptors in their brain specific to these plants. So it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to think like, oh, these are of the earth, these are here, they've been in use, but for whatever reason, they were um, classified as being more harmful or mm -hmm. being easily abused and having no medical benefit, but we're now seeing resurgence. So, that, and that's what I was going to go back to is when you said reclassified, I want to make sure that people understand what that means mm -hmm. is that they've classified it as something, but now they're going back to do more studies because they've seen benefits and then yes. they're going to, okay, okay. I just want to make exactly. sure I was following. So yeah. similar to like cannabis, right? So mm -hmm. federally at this time, cannabis is illegal, but in certain states they have made it legal because they're seeing such tremendous medical benefits for some people in some cases like PTSD, um, with cachexia, which means like severe um, appetite suppression and subsequent weight loss. So it helps people gain their appetite back, helps with nausea. We use it for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. We're using it for certain um, seizure disorders. So um, yeah. Yeah. Now that's, it's huge because a lot of people don't realize that a lot of pharmaceutical companies are using plant-based products. Obviously, they're using, they're putting a whole bunch of other things in there. But a lot of times, there are plant-based products in there. So I think you just expressing that let people understand that you don't have to take pills or anything like that. There could be some plant-based options out there that can give you your serotonin and your dopamine effect on some of the the issues that you have. And marijuana is one of them, as long as you're not using it. Obviously. Um, too much or if it's affecting you and stuff like that. But marijuana is helpful and there are studies to prove that. It's not just people saying it now. You know what I mean? So I think that's what makes it even more important is that we have to do our research and understand that there's other options out there as well other than just pills. Um, I And I always use this as a, a example and I don't have any facts or data. Uh, it's probably out there, but my mother, she was on hospice at one time. And um, the hospice company said, hey, we've seen miracles happen with cannabis oil. Um, obviously, you can't promote that and things like that. But I know from my own experience, when we did give my mother even just cannabis, it helped give her even more insight. Obviously, she still passed, but just having that little bit of life based off of a medication that is banned and it's thought to have no therapeutic efficacy made me a believer personally, not just hearing someone say that. So that stuff like that means a lot. It makes me want to pay attention to other plant-based options out there. So um, thank you for, for, for bringing that up. Yeah. But, and we also need to make sure that our people are being included in those research trials because we also have to um, understand how does this work in us in today's world? And, and, and if these are so remarkable with such incredible remission rates, why aren't these things being offered to people like us? Right. That, that is a magical question. <laughs> but, yeah. That's a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Uh, I don't know. I think we, we may have, we may have lost them. Should I have been more inclusive? Yeah. I'm just staring. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, hopefully he gets yeah. back on. You now but, just noticing he wasn't there, Richard. <laughs> he'd be, he'd be for a minute. He'd be he'd be for a minute. <laughs> um, At least but, you know, <laughs> Things come up, but hey, we appreciate you guys coming on the episode once again on King's Hour. And again, so, is there any last remarks that you would like to leave us? with um, Dr. Ferguson. I know you have a couple of events that are coming up, so please let our listeners know where they can reach you and hear from you a little bit more. Yeah, so Black Physicians of Utah, we are trying to do as much as we can to uh, empower the Black community, educate the Black community, but also be a resource. So we have a YouTube channel, so if you just type in Black Physicians of Utah, subscribe to our channel. Uh, also, you can, uh, we have a live event coming up with Dr. Baden and I, so if you'd like the knowledge we were dropping on 
you know, from her part one and me joining her for part two, we'll be talking yeah. about patient empowerment and patient advocacy uh, at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time uh, on IG Live. Uh, and that's at, at black underscore of physicians underscore physician. Uh, uh, <laughs> type of black physicians at Utah in the IG and it'll, it'll come up. It'll come up. Check us out. And when, uh, when did you say that is? Uh, it's to, it's it's Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Mountain. Yeah. Got you. So we'll right. be there uh, and with several other physicians and a brother from the VA. And But just also go to bpou.org and follow us. We post a lot of our events there. We'll be at several health fairs in Utah. But we, we, we're we we here to educate Black community nationally. So if people That's like right. what's coming up, well, May 31st, we've got uh, COVID and the economy. And uh, we're going to be presenting there what's going to be, what has been the impact uh, to us in the Black community as a result of COVID. Because many of us were frontline workers. We're the ones that didn't have the option to stop working and stay at home and be remote. And I'm going to discuss what that impact has, has been and what's our way forward. So, uh, and I do that with one of my mentees. So that'll be May 31st, probably at 6 p.m. Excellent. We will make sure that we post all those. We want to be an advocate as well because we want to learn as much as we can and hopefully in, in light and incite others as well. So I appreciate that. Um, we will be joining that most definitely. And Dr. Baden, anything you want to leave us with? You know, thank you all for this opportunity. It's been such a great, um, just it's just been so great to work with all of you and to learn from you as well. Um, so just make sure you listeners tune into King's Hour every week. Go back and re-listen to some episodes. These guys are doing some good work. Yes. Well, the pleasure is ours. The pleasure is definitely ours. We appreciate it. Well, again... For our listeners, make sure that you like, listen, and share. You can follow us on all podcast platforms at King's Hour. And like I said, you can always look and find us on YouTube as well on King's Hour. And like we always say, make sure you be kings today and every day. Peace. Mm -hmm.